All right, let's take our Bibles tonight and uh, turn to Matthew chapter 24. And I'm going to begin reading in verse number 32. And um, I, I, I'm not, uh, in fact, I'm not going to, I'm going to read it, but we'll, I'll, I'll preach through as I read it. So I'm not going to have you stand for the reading of the Word of God. Uh, but let me just kind of review a little bit of what we looked at last week. Last week, we began to look in Matthew chapter number 24. And beginning in verse number 3, Jesus began to give us the signs of His coming and begin to show us what the tribulational period is going to be like. And when you come to verse number 15, we know that this is the middle of Daniel's 70th week because uh, Jesus tells us that it is when the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of Daniel the prophet. Okay, So this portion of, uh, of Matthew 24 is when the middle of the 70th week comes. And then when you come down to verse number 27, all the way to verse number 31, God begins to show us what's going to happen when Jesus Christ comes back. Now, uh, a large portion of our time was spent last week looking uh, at reasons why this is not referring to the rapture of the church, but rather the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth to establish His kingdom. Now, here's where a lot of people get messed up in their eschatology is that they do not know how to put a difference between the two. Now, here's, here's a good way. This is how I was taught uh, in expressing this view. And I think it's, I, I don't think it's, I think it's a good, safe, biblical uh, expression of, of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we refer to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we refer to one return, but it's done in two phases. Okay? So the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back and we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back in the air, and the Bible teaches that the saved believers are going to be caught up, but before saved believers are caught up, uh, the Bible teaches that those who are dead in Christ are going to be resurrected. And so I remember hearing when I was a kid that the dead in Christ are referring to the Presbyterians. They're the dead in Christ, and so they're going to be raised up, right? Just a little bit of humor. Whenever I say a little bit of humor, my wife always says that was very little humor. So, um, And so the Bible teaches that at the rapture, the dead in Christ are going to rise up, and then we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up together with them in the air, to, or together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so here in a couple weeks, I'll be preaching exclusively on the rapture of the church, and uh, that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. But when we talk about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter number 24, uh, look what it says in verse number 27. It says, For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gath gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And that's referring, uh, that's what is going to happen before the day of the Lord. Now look at verse number 30, because here's the sign of the end of the world. The Bible says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in power, in the, cl the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. This is the time when Jesus returns in His glory to establish a kingdom in which He will rule over. And look at verse number 31, And He shall send His angels with a great sound of the trumpet, and they shall gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now that's where we left off last week. Now if you were not here last week, um, if, I, if, I went, if I started to go in review mode, then we would be here for about 30 minutes just reviewing everything that we looked at, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to do that tonight. All right? Now, Look at if you, but if you were not here and want to hear that message, you can go on our website and that message is that message message posted on the website because I know there. Okay, so uh, you need you got to get another hard drive, right? Is that right? Okay, so I don't know the technical terms, but brother Tom's brother Tom takes the sermons home. And he puts them on the web page, he downloads them in audio and video, puts them on YouTube. It takes a lot of time for that to happen, and Brother Tom's hard drive went down, and so I don't know the technic tech technicalities of that, but uh, 
there's some problems there. Okay. Now look at verse number 32, all right? Now, now here's what you need to know. From verse 32 all the way to chapter 25 to verse number 30. Okay, so that's a lot of verses. From chapter, from verse number 32 in chapter 24 to tap, chapter 25 and verse number 30, God is going to break the narrative and He's going to give us illustrative parables. He's going to give us illustrative parables. Uh, Kesron, I need you to find me page number um, Jesus is coming again because I want to use that as a sermon illustration here in just a moment. Jesus is coming again, or coming again. Uh, and I'll read that in just a moment. Now, so Jesus tells us in verse number 31 that He's coming, and when He comes, He's going to gather His elect. He's going to establish His kingdom, and we'll see that in chapter number 25. But look at verse number 32, because in verse number 32, Jesus is going to give us some practical exhortation. Jesus is going to give us some illustrative parables to teach us some lessons in light of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thing, friends. If we learn everything there is to know about the return of Jesus Christ and we do not allow it to move us to serve God with greater intensity and zeal, then, then what has it profited us? And so Jesus is giving us this great truth about His return and, and He pauses here to push some buttons in our lives and give us some warnings and give us some, some instruction and give us some exhortation in how we are to live in light of the return of Christ. Now, now I believe that this return is referring to the coming of Christ to the earth, but that doesn't mean that we cannot take these truths and apply them to the rapture of the church. Okay, So if, if we know that the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth is suddenly and, un, and unexpectedly, as we'll learn in just a moment, that also can be said about the rapture of the church. It will be sudden. And it will be unexpected. And so these are some lessons that we can learn about the coming of the Lord as it relates to us as believers. Now look what it says in verse number 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. All right? Now, if you know anything about the fig tree, the, the fig tree is a prominent tree in the Old Testament Scriptures. Now, I, I, I didn't do it for sake of time. It would, it would be a sermon in and of itself. I've taught through this on other occasions on Wednesday nights and in Sunday school. But when you, when you talk about the fig tree, the fig tree often in the Bible is used in type of the nation of Israel. Okay? But not in this passage. Because look what the Bible says. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. All right, here's what we need to know about the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. And so the fig tree uh, going through a Judean uh, winter, uh, cold, uh, long winter time, when that fig tree began to put forth its leaves, you could look at the budding, you could look at the blossom of those leaves and know that summer was at hand. That summer's right around the corner. And so God says here, when the branch is yet tender and putteth forth his leaves, you know that summer is nigh. You know that summer is near. Now look at verse number 33. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Now I grew up in an independent Baptist church my entire life, and I remember hearing preachers preach on this and say uh, that this fig tree represented the nation of Israel. And they would go back to May 6th or May 14th, 1948, when na uh, the nation of Israel uh, regained their status as a nation, and they said that, uh, that the fig tree uh, is blossoming, and so the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to take place within that generation. And most people figured out that a generation in the Bible would come to about 40 years. Uh, the word generation is used uh, in different ways other than 40 years. And so I remember in the early 80s when I was a little kid that people thought that Jesus was going to return uh, by 1988. Because they say, look, the fig tree is blossoming. And if the fig tree is blossoming, know that, uh, that it is nigh. And so they would use this passage to try to prove that, that erroneous doctrine. Now let me, let me just say this. Yes, the fig tree in the Bible typifies the nation of Israel, but that's not how God is using it in this context. All God is saying is that look at a fig tree, and a fig tree would have been 
something that everybody would have been able to identify with in those days. And he says, when you see the leaves, let me get it right, when you see the branches tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is close. Now look what he says in verse number 30. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things. Well, what things is he referring to? Well, those things that we learned about last week. All the things that were mentioned in Daniel's 70th week. We saw that God mentioned rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes and pestilence. And God says, look, when you see all these things, you better know that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is soon. Now, look what he says here in verse number 34. He says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And so people would take verse number 34 when I was a kid and I remember hearing them say it and they would say the generation that was alive in 1948 will not the generation that was alive in 1948 is the generation that is going to be alive to see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus says this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now now that's what I heard my whole life as a kid. That's not that's not what God is teaching. God is teaching that the generation that is in existence when all of these things are going on, what things? Well, the things that we learned about. Uh, we read through them in all of chapter number 24. Uh, nation's going to rise against nation and wars and rumors of wars and all of these things. Uh, the abomination of desolations, the specific things that are mentioned in Daniel's 70th week. God is saying that the generation that is in existence in that time period are going to be alive to witness the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that doesn't mean that everyone born in that time period is going to be alive to witness the coming of the Lord, but that generation is going to be the generation that will witness the coming of Jesus Christ to this earth. Now look what he says in verse number 35. He says this, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Can I get an amen on that? I mean, we know that one day the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. We know that one day Jesus is going to destroy the heaven and the earth and create a new heaven and earth. But Jesus said, even though all these things are going to pass away, we know one thing is for sure and one thing is certain is that my word shall never pass away. I'm glad for that. I'm glad we can have confidence in the word of God. I'm glad we can have assurance and certainty concerning the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. But now look, as we put this verse into his context, what is Jesus referring to? Well, look at verse number 35. He says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Do you know what Jesus Christ is teaching us? Jesus Christ is teaching us about the certainty of his coming. This ought to remove any doubt about the certainty of the coming. Jesus Christ is coming again, and there ain't one thing you and I can do about it. Because Jesus teaches us here in verse number 35 that His coming is certain, that His coming is sure. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Well, what did Jesus just reference to? Well, you read verse 27 down to verse number 31. Jesus referenced the coming of the Lord to this earth. Jesus says it's going to happen, the certainty of His return. And there are those who scoff. And there are those who mocked, as it was in 2 Peter chapter 3, and they say, where is the promise of His coming? Well, the promise of His coming is sure, and the promise of His coming is certain, because He says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but My word shall not pass away. Now look what He says in verse number 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not even the, or excuse me, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So in verse 35, Jesus, Jesus teaches us about the certainty of the, of the coming. And now in verse number 36, Jesus says something about the unexpectancy of His coming. Now even though uh, those who are alive can gauge the times and the seasons of His return by the signs that Jesus gives to us, no man knows the day and no man knows the hour. 
And so there's been a lot of people in years gone by that have tried to put dates and try to put times, and they've made a lot of money doing it on when Jesus Christ is coming back. And every single one of those people have been found to be liars because nobody knows the day and nobody knows the hour. Now, I can tell you for sure when Jesus Christ is coming. Or I can tell, I, I can tell you at least uh, better than they can. You ready for this? I know that today we're one day closer than we were yesterday. And when we get to tomorrow, we'll be one day closer tomorrow than we were today. And that's the extent is how far I'll, I'll try to predict of when Jesus Christ is coming. When I was a kid, I used to think that Jesus Christ was coming somewhere around the year 2060. And I never told anybody that. I'm not putting dates on that. I'm just saying that was, you know, I try to figure it all out. But here's what the Bible says. No man know it. You don't know and I don't know. No man knows the day. No man knows the hour other than the Father. And now look at verse number 37, all right? It says this. But as the days of no were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now this is interesting. Because God likens the days that lead up to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ like the days of Noah. And if you go to Luke's account, Luke also likens it to the days of Lot. Now growing up, I heard a lot of preachers talk about all the sin that was associated with the, with the days of Noah. And there was a lot of sin in those days. But can I remind everybody, there's a lot of sin in every generation. And there's a lot of sin in every day and time. And people uh, in, in our day are just as wicked and just as godless as the people in Noah's day and in the days of Lot. But that's not what Jesus Christ is trying to teach us. Because look what it says. It says, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now look at verse number 38. For as in the days that were before the flood, notice what they were doing. They were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Now let me ask you this question. Is there a sin with eating? That's right. I'm not talking about overeating, but is it a sin to eat? Is it a sin to drink? Is it a sin to marry? Is it a sin to give in marriage? Absolutely not. That's not what Jesus Christ is condemning here. Jesus Christ wasn't condemning their activity. Notice what Jesus Christ was condemning. Look at the following verse in verse number 39. He says this, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, what did they not know? Well, let me show you what was happening in the days of Noah. Go, if you would, to Genesis chapter number 6 very quickly. Genesis chapter number 6. And when you get there, say, glory to God. Glory to God. All right, look at verse number 5. Uh, through 7. Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 5 down through verse number 7. Now notice what the Bible says here. The Bible says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and it repented the Lord that he hath made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And so you read on through chapter number 6, and you go to chapter number 7, and look at verse number 6. The Bible says, And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters that was upon the earth and so what do we find taking place in the days of Noah? Well, in the days of Noah, God was, was bringing about and God uh, declared that there would be impending judgment upon the people in Noah's day. And what did God do? Noah, God judged the world because of their sin. Now, here's the thing. Did God give them warning of impending judgment? Yes or no? Absolutely. How did God give them warning of impending judgment? Who was the preacher that they had available to them? Does anybody know? That's right. Noah. Go to 1 Peter if you would. I think it's 2 Peter. 
I'll find it. I, I know I can see it in my Bible. Sometimes I might get the references wrong, but I can figure it out when I get over there. Um, go to 2 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 5. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 5. Now notice what the Bible says in verse number 5, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So the Bible says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Do you know who preached the righteousness of God? Do you know who preached uh, to this, this unbelieving, wicked generation that lived during the days of Noah? It was Noah. And so they had warning. Uh, Noah preached, and I've heard preachers say that Noah preached 120 years. I, 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 I don't necessarily believe that. I, and it would take me about 15 minutes to show you from Scripture, but I'll, I'll do a little Bible study on it in the future. But I believe, I'm just taking an educated guess, I believe it was probably 60, 70, maybe 80 years in which Noah was preaching uh, to these people and warning them of the impending judgment that God was going to bring a flood. But not only did they have the warning of the preaching of Noah, what else was given to them that there was a flood coming? It was the ark itself. I mean, for, for years, Noah and his sons are laboring and working and building this boat and building this ark and people seeing it. Uh, it was a testimony that the floods were coming, that the rain was coming. Now, go back to verse number uh, chapter 24 and look what God emphasizes here. It says here, let me read it in verse number 37. It says, now look, in verse number 35, he gives us the certainty of His coming. And then in verse number 36, He gives us the unexpectancy of His coming. And so because the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is certain and unexpected, it ought to cause us to live in such a way. Well, how are we to live? Well, we're not to live in the way that the people in Noah's day lived. How did they live? Well, look how they lived. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying, and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not. Well, how did they not know? How did they not know? Noah was a preacher. The ark was, was, was in building for, for years upon years. How did they not know? Do you know why they did not know? Because they did not listen. Do you know why they did not know? Because they were unconcerned. It wasn't that God was condemning their sinful lifestyle, although they were wicked and they were living a uh, lifestyle, but that's not the point of this passage. The point of this passage is to teach us that if the coming of the Lord is certain, and it is, if the coming of the Lord is unexpected, and it is, then that teaches us that we ought to live every single day of our lives, not as the people that lived in Noah's day. We ought to live in light of the return of the Lord with concern. We ought to be concerned about the coming of the Lord. The Bible says they knew it not. They were not concerned. They lived as if there was no warning. They lived as if there was no exhortation. They lived as if Jesus Christ was not coming. And too many times, we as God's people go about our day, our life, our week without any thought to the fact that Jesus Christ could come back at any moment. Friends, I want to remind everybody, Jesus Christ is coming back. This is not a fairy tale. This is not a story that we tell our kids before we tuck him into the bed. No, Jesus, He warns us about the certainty of His coming. He says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Jesus tells us that it is certain. And Jesus tells us it is unexpected. And so therefore, we ought to live with some desire to do all that we can for Jesus Christ. We ought to live with this knowledge in mind, knowing that He's coming. And so notice what he says, verse number 39, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the Son of coming of the Son of Man be. And there's going to be more specifically now as we get into the context, 
during the days of the tribulational period, there are going to be people that are not going to heed the warning of those who are going to preach the truth. There are going to be those who give no thought to the fact that Jesus Christ is going to come. I believe it's in Revelation chapter... Um, uh, let me show you... Um, uh, go with me. Let me find it. Go to Revelation chapter 9, I believe it is. Revelation chapter number 9. Look at Revelation chapter number 9. And here the sixth trumpet is sounded. And this is, this is where the tribulational period is increasing and intensifying. And if you look at chapter number 9, verse number 18, when the sixth trumpet is sounded, the Bible says, by these three was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouth. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, and their tails were like unto serpents and had heads with them. They do hurt. And the rest of men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols and gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murderers, nor of their sorcerers, nor of their fornications, nor of their thefts. You talk about dark and dangerous days. The days of the tribulational period or Daniel's 70th week is going to be so dark and man's hearts are going to be so evil and so wicked that even with all of these calamities upon them, they're still stubborn and refuse to get right with their Creator and right with their God. And they're going to live as if no warning is given. They're going to live as if nothing is going to happen, just like in the days of Noah. And the Bible says until the very day that Noah entered into the ark, they gave no concern of these things. And the Bible says, and the flood took them all away. Now go back to Matthew 24. And I want to hurry on this. Now look what it says. Look at verse number 40. Now, now here, now I'm going to kind of transition this to some practical teaching and get into a little bit of doctrinal teaching. Now look what it says. Then two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Now when you read verses 40 through 41, people who believe that this coming is referring to the rapture of the church, they say, right there is the rapture. Does that not sound like the rapture? Two people in the field, one's there, the other's taken away. Two people are in the mill grinding, one's left, and the other's taken away. And so people would say that this is referring to the rapture of the church. No, this is not referring to the rapture of the church. And, and let me just back up and give you the context. Now remember what was given to us in verse number 39. Look what it says in verse number 39. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Now in Noah's day, who was taken away in judgment? The unbelievers, isn't that right? The unbelievers were taken away in judgment, not the saved. Where was Noah and his family, the only saved people left on the earth? They were saved inside of the ark. They remained in the ark on the earth. But these people were taken away in judgment. And so when the Bible says, then two shall be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. What's God referring to? He's referring to those who are taken away are those who are taken away in judgment. Those who are going to be here are taken away in the rapture. They're not taken away in judgment. They're taken away from the judgment. They're taken away from the wrath. And so this is not referring to the rapture of the church. This is referring to the time when Jesus Christ sets up a kingdom and those that are saved are going to be allowed to stay on the earth and populate the kingdom. Those who are lost, guess where they're going to? They're going to hell. And the Bible brings that out in Matthew 25, and we'll see that in just a moment. Now look at verse number 42. Because in verse number 42, he tells us this, Watch therefore... Now, now, what does it mean to watch? All right? Well, when I get to verse number 44, verse number 44 is going to interpret verse number 42. So stay with me, all right? Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. All right? But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, 
he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. And so what God is saying, if he would have known, he would have been prepared. Isn't that right? How many's ever had your house broken into? Anybody? Yeah, I have. Have you? you were you in the house when it happened? Six times it happened? My goodness. My goodness. And you weren't in the house any of those times? My goodness. Well, i got to listen to some of these stories after church. Uh, I've had, our house has been broken into one time uh, when I still lived with my parents when I was in Bible college, and um, they took all our guns. Lost my shotguns, and my dad lost a bunch of his guns, and um, that was a bummer. But if I would have known when the thief was coming to rob us, guess what I would have? I would have sat there with the shotgun, been ready for him. But I didn't know. And because I, I didn't know, I wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared. And so God is saying, that's why He says in verse number 42, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Now look at verse number 44. Now look what He says. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. And so Jesus is talking about the fact that not only do we need to be concerned, but we need to be re prepared. I want to ask you this question. If Jesus Christ was to come back right now and we were to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, how would we fare? You know, the Bible, uh, take your Bibles and turn over to um, take your Bibles and turn over to 1 John chapter 2 in verse number 28. Brother Kesler, can I have the hymn book? 1 John chapter 2. Sorry, brother. 1 John chapter 2, and look at verse number 28. And then let me read this, this hymn, and I was going to sing it tonight. I don't know why I forgot to sing it. But I, how many of all know, I don't think we've sung this hymn a whole lot since I've been the pastor, partly because we don't have the music. But you all remember this marvelous message we bring, glorious carol we sing. Wonderful word of the King, Jesus is coming again, coming again, coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon, coming again, coming again. Oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming again. I, I love this, huh? Okay. Yeah, that's I, I don't play around. Now, now here's here's what um here's what I like. The third verse says, "Standing before Him at last, trial and trouble all past, crowns at His feet we will cast." Jesus is coming again. Ever thought about that day? What it's going to be like? when we take the crowns that we've earned in our service to the Lord Jesus Christ and we cast them at the feet of Jesus. I've thought about that. I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know if it's going to be like a long line and one's going to go and then uh, we kind of anxiously wait for our turn. And can you imagine uh, there are, are men and women that stand before Him and have all kind of crowns upon their head. But we don't keep those crowns because we're not worthy of those crowns. Jesus Christ is the only one worthy of those crowns and we come before the presence of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we take those crowns and we cast them at the feet and we fall prostrate before Him and we say, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive honor. Uh, and we give those crowns to Jesus Christ and we lay them before Him because He and He alone is worthy. Have you ever thought about what that day would be like if we had no crowns? Because the Bible tells us in the book of the Revelation, let no man take thy crown. There is a possibility that some people will only be saved by fire. In other words, there will be those who will only be saved from the torments of hell, but they'll have nothing to show for their life for the Lord Jesus Christ, and they'll have nothing to give to Him at that day. And look what it says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 28. It says this. It says, uh, it says and now little children abide in Him that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him, before Him at His coming. 
You know what this verse is teaching? This verse is teaching that there are two possibilities. There are two ways in which a believer can meet the Lord Jesus Christ. There are some who can meet the Lord with boldness. That's what the word confidence means. Some are going to be able to stand, and that word doesn't mean brash or cocky or arrogant. The word picture is that we, we will not be ashamed. We'll be able to look Him in the eye knowing that we served Him with our life and did everything that we knew to do with the light that was given to us to honor Him and serve Him. And we'll be able to cast those crowns at His feet. But some people will not be able to meet Him in that light. Some people, as the Word of God says here, will be ashamed before Him at His coming. Some people will stand before the Lord and have their heads down and and their hearts are full of sorrow because they neglected to take advantage of the opportunities that God has given us to serve Him here and now. God says, My little children, abide in Him that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. How are you going to meet the Lord? I wonder how our church will fare when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ when God has given us this field to labor and to serve and to minister and to reach out and try to bring people to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. How will we fare one day? How will we do? And Jesus tells us in Matthew to be ready. Why? Because when Jesus Christ comes, no one's going to know the hour. If the good man would have known, he would have been alert and he would have been waiting. And Jesus is teaching, be like someone who's ready for the thief to come. Be always watching. Always waiting. Always looking. Always with a heart that is expecting that he could come at any moment. And then look at what he says as we finish up. Notice, He says this, Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. God likens a servant as as wise and as faithful whom the Lord hath made ruler over his house to give him meat in due season. This man is not lazy. This man is not negligent. Uh, The Bible says in verse number 46 that he is busy doing when the Lord cometh. He's doing what the master has left for him to do. And God calls him a wise and faithful servant. But look at verse number 48. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. And it shall begin to smite the fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come to him in a day when he looketh not for him, and an hour when he is not aware of, and he shall cut him asunder and appoint his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you know why this man was an evil servant? Do you know why this man was not commended by the master of the house? Because this man lived as if the master of the house would not return And his attitude was, my Lord delayeth his coming. And friends, really, there's only two kinds of servants that are mentioned here. There is the faithful and the wise, and the evil and the unwise. What kind of servant are we going to be? Are we going to be the servant that has the attitude that my Lord delayeth his coming? Are we going to be negligent of the responsibilities that Christ has given us to do as we wait for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, Because it's the wise and the faithful that is ready. It is the wise and the faithful that are concerned. It is the wise and the faithful that are busy doing what Christ has given us to do. Friends, I don't know when he's coming. I don't know what day He's coming, but I know this. I know the certainty of His coming. He's coming. And I know this. I know we don't know the day or the hour. And in light of that, how are we to live? I remember growing up, and this was before... um, We're done. You can close your Bibles. But um, you all are looking at the clock like, whoa. Brother Hanch, you weren't here last week. I preached till. um, an hour, it was like an hour and a half. It was like, yeah, it was just, it was just about eight o'clock. It was, no, yeah, it was like an hour and thirty some minutes. So my wife is sitting on the front row, going like this, no, because I'm like, let's go to another verse, and she's like, no, no, don't do that. So I got, it, I got it short tonight. 
I remember when we were growing up as kids, and um, we lived in Naples, Florida. And um, we had family that lived in the state of New York. And uh, I remember my cousins, Jimmy and Bobby, and uh, their dad, my, Jimmy and Bobby are my second cousins, Joe, their dad, my first cousins. And I remember at times they, were, they would come down to Florida and visit us. And that was the day before cell phones and, you know, uh, the smartphones that we have today where you can just, you know, easily find and text and find out someone's ETA and the GPSs and all that kind of stuff. And so back in those days, you know, you knew that they were leaving on Thursday and they sometime were planning on being here on a Saturday or Sunday, just depending, but you didn't know when. And so I remember that when we would have company come, especially from the state of New York, not knowing what particular time they were getting here, my mom and dad would make us, I mean, me and my brother, we'd have to clean the house and make sure our rooms were tidy and our beds were made and all the toys were put away. And if anything got out of sorts, you know, they would yell at us and do some other things to us and so forth and so on and make us keep the house in order. Why? Because we did not know when they were coming. We did not know when they would be here. And as a result of that, we had to live for those, for those day or two as if they could show up at any moment. Everything had to be prepared and everything had to be ready. Well, that's what Jesus Christ is teaching us here in Matthew chapter number 24. He's coming. We know that's for sure, but we don't know when he's coming. And so in light of that, we ought to live with concern and we ought to live with watchfulness. You know what the word watch means? Do you know back in the Old Testament when uh, they would have watchtowers? Y'all know what a watchtower was? Brother Howard, you remember back in those days what a watchtower was? Yeah, that's right. A JW, yeah, right. Uh, a watchtower was a tower where the watchman would stand up and he would keep a watch while everybody else was asleep. And while everybody else was asleep, to be a watchman means that you had to be awake and you had to be alert. God tells us to watch, to be awake, to be alert, to be conscious of the fact that He's coming and He could come at any moment. And He tells us to be ready. He tells us to live. And look, if you say you're ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you'll be like that wise, faithful servant who kept the affairs of his master's house in order because he knows that the master could come at any time. I'm glad to know He's coming. I think uh, 327 times in the New Testament. 319 times, I, I reckon it is. God teaches us that He's coming. You know how many books are in the New Testament? Someone say it. 27. Can you imagine, uh, how, what, what town is 27, roughly 30 miles from here? Anybody know? Roughly 30 miles. Brother Rob? Somewhere 30 miles from here. Trenton? I think that's farther than 30. Philly's a little closer than 30 miles. So let's say Chester, PA. I have no idea where that's at. What is it? All right, let's say King of Prussia. I've been there before. Imagine driving to King of Prussia and seeing 319 road signs that says, bridges out, bridges out, bridges out when you get to King of Prussia, bridges out, bridges out, bridges out, bridges out. If you saw that sign 319 times in 30 miles, don't you think you would get the message that the bridge is out when you got to King of Prussia? You journey through the New Testament 27 books over 300 times, God says, He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Look, He's coming and we better start living like He's coming. Amen.